our next Renaissance artist that we're going to talk about and Ninja Turtle namesake is Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Leonardo was fittingly the leader of the turtles because Leonardo da Vinci probably was the most well-rounded of our Renaissance men. Um, Leonardo is pictured here in a self-portrait that he did. Um, some have even laid his self-portrait over the top of one of his most famous paintings saying that maybe that indeed is a portrait of himself even in the Mona Lisa but um, we'll let you be the judge when we take a look at that in just a little bit. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was a um, great inventor, painter, um, sculptor, uh, he drew biographies, um, he was patronized by some of the most famous men in Italy and France, um, that's patronage is where they will pay an artist to do the works, um, and he just basically was a genius and we'll talk about some of that genius here as many of you know him. Um, da Vinci uh, spent a lot of time drawing animals and human figures and he wanted them in their ideal form. Um, he invented new ideas for architecture, um, actually had an opportunity to walk up a set of stairs that were a double helix, uh, a lot like DNA. Uh, I started up one set of stairs and my mom and stepdad went the other direction up the other set of stairs and we walked on spiral staircases that were stacked on top of each other up um, six stories in this castle in France and it um, was Leonardo's design and we never saw each other until we got off the stairs um, and walked around the room to see each other and the idea was that an entire um, battalion of soldiers could march up the stairs and down the stairs at the same time without running into each other uh, essentially um, you know resupplying troops and and helping defend the fortress if need be um, the next painting that I'd like to talk to you about of uh, Da Vinci's is probably the most famous painting in the world um, this is the Mona Lisa as you can see here the Mona Lisa is not um, terribly striking in these photographs as a history student myself I looked at the Mona Lisa many times and um, was not excited to go see it when I had the opportunity to go see it in the Louvre um, the thing about the Mona Lisa is that um, she is absolutely captivating in person um, the focal point of da Vinci's painting is in the eyes here um, and what that does is it draws you in and when you go to the Louvre the Mona Lisa is on a um, you know roughly a 13 inch piece of wood um, and you walk into the room and as I said I wasn't too excited about the Mona Lisa but as soon as you make eye contact with her you are just absolutely captivated by her beauty um, the depth of the painting uh, gives us some evidence of the perspective net that we talked about um, there's something to view in every rectangle of this painting in the back obviously we see um, the landscape of some type of Italian area but if you block this section off there's obviously something to be seen in every area um, in the top section in the middle obviously is the focal point or the face of the Mona Lisa um, through the central section um, is clearly her robe and gowns and this bridge here in the back is thought to be a design of da Vinci's, uh, his architecture. Um, and then um, obviously down here the hands tell us a different message. Um, let's start at the top. Um, da Vinci's layering of colors creates this see-through veil on the Mona Lisa and her hair and how it lays and there's actually texture in that hair. Um, the lighting creates the shadow and the shading of the areas which creates a, a new form of realism, kind of a new realism in painting that hadn't been seen before. Um, obviously you can see kind of a sheer layer of her cloak here um, and her arms are crossed in a sign of chastity so this actually would be a spiritual um, 
expression that she was an unmarried woman and that she was indeed pure um, but the the rest of the painting um, kind of indicates maybe a little bit more secular in in its actual realism the fact that um, she's probably just an ordinary woman um, you know the wife of of a witch, rich patron who painted paid to have this portrait done um, that would be more secular or of the world as it is. Da Vinci also was a great inventor. Um, he invented a couple of different flying machines models. Here's similar idea similar to that of a bat wing. Um, this is a helicopter model um, and as you, if you can see Da Vinci's notes obviously are in Italian but they're in ink and backwards. Uh, some people call this mirror writing. Um, and very simply, uh, it's thought that Da Vinci was uh, predominantly left-handed in his writing. Uh, other things that Da Vinci did were he dissected up to 19 corpses um, and drew the muscle structures, as you can see here, of the arm. It's thought that this practice in his notebooks helped him with his realism in his paintings. Um, here he depicts the Vitruvian man, or the ideal form of a man. Uh, a couple of Roman um, ideals that you can see here, obviously, the two fingers that are put together um, and again this is the ideal form of a man in motion there. Uh, more drawings of his dissections, there's um, skull drawings inside of the skull, outside of the skull, fetal drawings, bone drawings, um, you know starting to see some of the digestive areas um, and even a heart that's exquisitely drawn out in his notebooks. Okay, uh, welcome to Renaissance Art Talk, and our first option that we're going to look at is Raphael. Uh, best way to get to Raphael is control click on the link. Should pop up here showing the School of Athens, and um, this is actually a presentation done by Alyssa Lemire and Elizabeth Rogers. We're going to make it big screen, um, and we're just going to follow it straight through here. Um, this is the School of Athens, and and this is set in the traditional Renaissance style. You're going to see the homage paid to the traditional Greek uh, philosophers, even some of the Persian um, Zoroaster ideas that created Christianity, some Greek and Roman gods, and then the dome here is actually set um, in the style of um, the Sistine Chapel, or excuse me, the um, St. Peter's Basilica, which is is quite unreal if you ever get a chance to go see it it's it's wonderful to see so um, let's go ahead and get started here and this is Raphael and this is his painting the school of Athens Raphael was born in Urbino Italy um, his father was a painter and he's known for the clarity of his paintings mastering the art of realism in his works and many of his paintings depict aspects of the Renaissance period including religion nudity and a revival of culture and learning the religion pieces obviously are going to be the spiritual pieces the nudity and the revival of the classics of Greece and Rome that would be more of the secular part of his paintings and the secular portion of the Renaissance. Raphael also, also did some minor architecture um, and he can be split into three distinctive periods. His early career, Florentine period, and the Roman period. He spent four years in Florence and then he went to Rome where his best works were produced and he died in 1508. Um, Raphael painted um, the Transfiguration and this is a spiritual painting. Um, this was when he was in Rome and it's obviously the Transfiguration of the Christ figure from death into his spiritual form. 
Uh, here we have the coronation of the Virgin where the crown is being placed on the head of the Virgin Mary. Uh, typical of the spiritual art, you'll oftentimes see these halos painted around heads. Um, and then, um, you know, the the idea that um, these, these gentlemen obviously probably are the apostles here and um, they're painted in the Greek and Roman style, uh, but very clearly looking towards the heavens. Um, you know, obviously heavenly bodies are floating up here, um, so very spiritual in nature. Um, Raphael is um, credited with um, some paintings in Santa Maria del Popolo and Piazza del Popolo, Rome. Um, there's a private chapel that was designed for Augustina Chigi, and it's completed by Bernini more than a century after Raphael's death. Uh, Bernini actually finished a lot of the works that were um, done by many, or started by Michelangelo and um, Raphael in Rome. Um, the purpose of Julius II is commissioned by Raphael to paint multiple frescoes for his personal library. Each painting was to represent one of the four parts of human knowledge, theology, philosophy, law, and the arts. And the School of Athens actually represents the philosophy in the room, and the picture as a whole is serving as a library or meeting place for humanists to discuss their ideas. Again, humanism is this idea that people can become better through religion or excuse me, through education. The type of median for the School of Athens, which again is one of the most famous works by Raphael, is Fresco. Um, and it's in the Vatican City in Rome. Um, and there are three walls that are covered by Raphael's paintings, but again, these are frescoes. We first saw frescoes with the um, Etruscans, and it is a plaster that is painted on when it's wet, so it's very difficult to get it right the first time, and, and this is obviously an incredible painting by Raphael. The composition is three-dimensional. It's obviously realism. There is quite a bit of perspective. Perspective is setting the um, depth of a painting, and it, the movement of the painting gives the impression of a long rectangle, as you can see in the upcoming shots. And obviously, you see the perspective of this side is drawn back to this point here, um, and the perspective is drawn back to a point here. This is um, kind of a two-point perspective, but clearly um, there's more perspective going back into the building here that's actually in open air more of a um, link back to kind of the Greek and Athenian societies um, as well as this light which is um, kind of a renaissance or rebirth idea this light is important Unity and balance are a key feature of this painting. The people are distributed evenly throughout the room. The two god statues balance each other. The dome gives the painting symmetry. And the center obviously runs down the middle of the main hallway of the building. Uh, being one of four paintings in the library it unifies all the ideas of humanism. And again, humanism is the idea that um, education can make the world better and it can make each individual better. The mood of the painting is uplifting, it's enthusiastic, and again it's representative of humanism, which is an emphasis on the importance of knowledge and learning. As you can see, the painting is very bright, as we mentioned before, again this is kind of an idea of, um, you know, the Renaissance and this new way of thinking. Uh, a couple of key features from the painting. Plato and Aristotle are up front, center stage. They're pointing upward, which recognizes the world filled with possibilities and um, ethereal ideas or actual real ideas. Uh, and Aristotle is holding his hand towards the ground, discusses material issues and ideas that we can grasp. Um, and again, Aristotle gives us the golden mean as well as uh, Plato gives us the just state with his oligarchy. Another key feature here from your geometry is Pythagoras. Um, he was the, um, obviously, author of the Pythagorean theorem, which is helping a lot of you with your triangle. 
couple of key things here. Oftentimes Renaissance painters put themselves into the painting. Um, here's Raphael here, um, obviously pointed out there. And um, Ptolemy, uh, who is the Greek guy who decided that the world was round. Um, here he is holding the globe. Um, and then the prophet Zoroaster here um, is the founder of the um, Zoroaster, Zoroastrian religion in Persia, which is considered to be one of the predecessors to Christianity. Um, this is thought to represent the astronomer or the mathematician Democritus, and some even think that um, this is actually a kind of a pun on Michelangelo as he's kind of pouting and looking down when the rest of them are looking up. Uh, Michelangelo was quite a moody individual and so it's just kind of a, a reflection of him and, and a little bit of that. Um, next thing we see is a little bit interesting considering that Raphael was a um, artist who was patronized by um, the Pope himself, uh, head of the Catholic Church. Um, Raphael obviously um, who wanted to please his patron, but he also wanted to show the Renaissance. So um, we see the um, god Apollo, who is depicted here with music and poetry, um, the god of the sun, um, and he shows an emphasis on the revival of the Greek and Roman traditions. Again, this is the School of Athens, and this is one of the most famous works by Raphael. Again, um, this is uh, World History Class and Mr. Daniels, and um, students are trying to recall and name the famous works of Da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael, talking about perspective, realism, uh, the perspective net, dome, key features of idealism, and uh, patron. Uh, with Raphael, we've talked about perspective, we've talked about realism, obviously, uh, we've talked about the dome and St. Peter's, um, and with Da Vinci, we've talked about the perspective net, talked about realism, most definitely, patron, um, and then some of the key features of idealism. And our last artist that we need to look at today is uh, Michelangelo, so we will um, control click on the link here. And this brings us to our most well-documented um, and, and probably most talented artist of the group. Uh, Michelangelo was patronized by um, the Pope um, and one of the most powerful men in the world at the time, or in Europe at least. Um, the Pope um, commissioned Michelangelo to do several different works, um, and Michelangelo is one of the first artists to start signing his works, so um, that's how we know so much about Michelangelo. Uh, here he is, and Michelangelo um, was born at 6th of March in 1475, and he died the 18th of February 1564, um, and he was born in Caprice in Tuscany, Italy. He is a sculptor, painter, architect, and poet, and he now is in a church in Santa Croce, um, and claimed to be the greatest living artist of his lifetime. He's a hero of the high renaissance in Italy, and he exerted unparalleled influence on the development of Western art. Okay, here is the church where uh, Michelangelo is buried. Uh, if you travel inside the church, you will see his tomb, um, and these sculptures are, um, you know, realistic of what would be created by Michelangelo. <coughs> Michelangelo's parents wanted him to be a businessman and an artist. Um, he preferred to sculpt rather than paint. He sculpted David, um, the Pieta, the Madonna on the Stairs. Um, his artworks are evidences of his attraction for uh, male beauty. Um, he was commissioned to do Pope Julius II's tomb, and we'll take a look at Hercules from that tomb. 
Um, again, Julius II was the patron of a lot of uh, Michelangelo's art, and um, actually Michelangelo died before he finished um, the tomb itself, but um, a patron, again, is the person who pays the artist to do the artwork. Um, and he was also commissioned to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican City in Rome. Here we see David. Um, David is done in the classical Roman form uh, as the Renaissance is a rebirth of these classical Greek and Roman ideas. Um, David is um, secular and spiritual in that this is a revitalization of Greece and Rome where all statues were traditionally done in the buff or in the nude uh, but clearly David is a figure from the Bible as um, the uh, slayer of Goliath. Um, some key things about David um, are the um, second toe that is longer than the first. We know it today as dwarf toe syndrome as we talked about but um, you know the Greek and Romans considered it to be part of the ideal form. Um, the second part of this is um, the elongated features. You see the hand is elongated, the arm is a little bit longer in the statue, um, and the two fingers in the middle are set together. Um, the next figure, if you want to go see this actually, um, is behind a uh, bulletproof glass casing in St. Peter's Basilica. The Pieta is the picture of um, uh, Mary and then um, Christ after he has been crucified and taken down off the cross and is being prepared for um, his burial. Um, and this is a very, very moving piece, but as it is in St. Peter's Basilica and has a high traffic volume, um, and, and people put their hands on the sculptures to pray, and when they drag their hands off the sculptures, that creates an erosion uh, in order to um, retain the original form of this piece. They have put it behind glass. Um, the next is um, the uh, sculpture of Hercules, as we talked about on uh, Julius II's tomb. Um, Hercules, as you can't quite see, it's cut off here from the video, has a couple of horns up here. That would be very secular or worldly, uh, but obviously um, the story of Hercules is, is somewhat secular as well, as it is not a spiritual piece, but um, you can clearly see that it does include um, the ideal Greek and Roman form. It gets a little blurry here, but the this is the second toe, this is the first toe. Um, so it's kind of a look at um, his ability to sculpt and again his favorite sculptures were, uh, or sculpting was his favorite and David, the Pieta and um, Julius II's tomb were three of his sculptures. Um, his painting was greatly influenced by his sculptures. Uh, he wanted to make his life like as possible and um, he had naked males or the naked beauty of a man and the contrast of the facial types added interest and excitement. Uh, and he used the manner of style um, which is classic but um, adapted to fit realism. Um, here is the, let's go back to that, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Um, the chapel itself is, is quite interesting. It's supposed to be a chapel of prayer. Um, when I was there it was full of priests and nuns and tourists alike and all of them were commenting quite loudly on um, the beauty of the ceiling and the paintings done by Michelangelo. All of these paintings are frescoes. Um, they were done on scaffolding, him laying on his back, um, and just some amazing works. And, and literally is the story of the Bible, as most people couldn't read, most lay people couldn't read. So uh, when in the chapel, they would look at these paintings um, for the story of the Bible. and. Um, just just wonderful works but back to the story on the Sistine Chapel um, the um, <laughs> there's the attendant who is a guard uh, comes in and claps his hands three times and tells everybody to get quiet and they talk quieter for a while um, and and it's quite crowded and not really a place that would be conducive to prayer in my opinion but um, 
absolutely beautiful and a wonderful place to visit if you get the chance. This also um, kind of depicts this idea of the perspective net as you can see the different sections. These are obviously um, different scenes of the Bible but as you look across here each section if you were looking at a painting uh, would be a section that the artist in Renaissance time would want to um, section out and plan and make sure that um, there's balance and uniformity throughout the painting and that each section of the painting has something to offer the viewer. Here is actually a virtual reality um, tour of the um, Sistine Chapel and, and some of the main uh, portions that we'll see are Creation of Adam. Um, that's probably the most famous painting um, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. There's the floods, the sacrifice of Noah, the temptation and expulsion uh, from the garden, uh, the creation of Eve, as we talked about, the creation of the sun and the moon and the planets, um, and then God is separating the light from the darkness. Um, and then as we get into the outer layers, we're seeing, um, you know, some of the apostles and uh, some of those stories that are happening out there. And finally down here, one of the more famous um, works is The Last Judgment. So let's take a look at it as we go. Uh, first you have the creation of Adam. Obviously this is God from his heavenly angels surrounding him, reaching out and touching Adam. Um, and Adam is coming up out of the ground. Um, and this is a very, very spiritual scene. This is depicting, you know, the um, spiritual side of uh, Renaissance art in that most patrons of the art were actually the church itself. Um, the other piece of it, obviously, as you see, Adam is naked, um, and, and that would be a little bit more secular or worldly, um, coming from the Rome, Greek and Roman tradition, even though Adam, you know, obviously was naked in the Garden of Eden, if um, that's the teachings that you adhere to. Okay. Um, the next is um, Delphica, or the Oracle of the Delphi. Um, obviously, this would be very secular and not very spiritual, in that um, this comes from Greece. Here is the prophet Isaiah. Okay, more spiritual. Um, here's the temptation and expulsion. Um, here is the, um, you see the serpent, um, and this is actually a very, very interesting piece that I was, when I looked at it, was kind of struck by it. Obviously the serpent is oftentimes depicted as the snake and, and being very deceitful and stuff, but this serpent actually winds up into a man and reaches out and gives Eve the fruit, and here we see Adam picking the fruit, and then um, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden in all their shame. Here is our final stop on the virtual tour of the roof of the Sistine Chapel. Um, and this is very, very powerful, but also quite frightening. Um, here, Michelangelo has depicted a battle between uh, heavens and earth. Noticing, again, this very clearly talks about the perspective net. Um, you know, here are the heavenly angels, and uh, here are the um, demonic angels, or the hell angels, who are kind of tearing down the heavens, and um, everyone's gearing up for the battle here, and this is, these are um, the, what they'll be fighting over, and these are the people of the earth. Um, and then here we start to see some of them being dragged down. Um, here is the ferryman, um, and in a very, very um, spiritual painting, obviously going to heaven or hell on the cross here. Um, here's this idea of the ferryman coming from Egypt or the boatman who would take you across the water to uh, purgatory or hell. Um, and, and it's a very, very vivid um, demonic picture um, as you zoom in on the picture. Um, you know, if you if you look at the works um, of the Sistine, obviously the temptation and and the condemnation of man and um, prophet Isaiah, and then the creation of Adam, um, just wonderful, wonderful works um, by.
Finally, um, here's an included video on Michelangelo. If you want to uh, go to the website and check out the link, um, you can. And we'll close with a quote by Michelangelo. Every beauty which is seen here by persons of perception resembles more than anything else that celestial source from which we are all come. And this is a very spiritual piece of Michelangelo saying all the realism and all the, all the glory should be given to um, God and um, you know, kind of exemplifies the fact that he's worked for um, the Catholic Church for his entire career. Uh, here are the references, and uh, thank you for watching our three presentations on um, our artists Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael.